shape your patients and all this stuff. It's also the last thing we can do and maybe extra hiking. So let me remind you what we discussed uh, last time. Uh, so we said that when we talk about uh, non-equilibrium dynamics of many body systems, uh, trying to do it exactly is uh, uh, usually completely hopeless, but since the number of, uh, of uh, the size of group space uh, is exponentially in a macroscopic number, and uh, therefore what uh, I started introducing you is an approximate uh, way of analyzing dynamics uh, through variational wave functions. So uh, we also try uh, other ideas for variational approaches. So uh, you mentioned matrix product state, uh, I mentioned uh, the MRG. So I'll sort of try the emphasis of my presentation is to use variational state, which builds more on the traditions uh, of many body physics and uh, state and then how we can get beyond into description, not by uh, uh, relying more on our physical intuition rather than uh, uh, sort of sophisticated uh, numerical trees. And uh, the, uh, the general philosophy, as we discussed, is to always uh, do projection. So we said that we would uh, introduce final operational states, which we parameterize by set of parameters. Uh, and they give us a manifold of states, and we say, well, we believe that it's sufficient to reach manifold, which can describe all the uh, uh, important aspects of dynamics, or let's say they are rich to capture a good caricature of the ground state. And then when we look at dynamics uh, in real time, we always so we start with a instantaneous state back, but then we look at the change in time, like a small uh, variation, but then we have to project it uh, onto the conventional plane which is to say well, we always try to look at, sort of project the dynamics back into our uh, variational manifold and there is uh, uh, a general procedure for doing this we have to introduce basis vector <coughs> vectors in the tangential plane uh, uh, they don't have gen generally they're not orthogonal so we have to introduce uh, uh, sort of take into account uh, a finite overlap between them and then you will see this overlaps so we just project uh, uh, the changes uh, in this state factor, right? Of course, like as usual, look at the change in time, variation of the state factor is given by the Hamiltonian. So if we're looking at evolution in imaginary time, we find the ground state, it's Hamiltonian minus expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And so we'll look at this uh, change of the state factor projected into uh, our basis factor, and this gives us uh, the uh, kind of flow equations for our parameters. Okay, so uh, in the last uh, lecture we talked about uh, fermionic uh, uh, state, fermionic Gaussian states. Today we will do bosonic Gaussian states, but we will uh, uh, jump into it, let me pay tribute to a uh, person whose work actually underlies most of the things we'll be discussing today. So Roy Blauber, he was our uh, uh, colleague, he passed away uh, uh, in December of last year, so he was uh, the first person to actually introduce uh, coherent states, and actually he was uh, not only a brilliant physicist, but also a gentleman with a fantastic sense of humor, so for example, he was a writer of the so-called Eve Nobel Prizes, so <laughs> the finest uh, inventions uh, of, uh, of the year. So that's actually a picture from uh, one of his uh, participations. So he actually was awarded Eve Nobel Prize before he got the real Nobel Prize. <laughs> so, uh, and I think it was for some, uh, something that had to do with quantum work. Uh, not because it was not his intention, but I think it was our, uh, the other way actually showing that yes, there is no mention of properties of quantum work. Anyway, but let me remind you, uh, his key invention is uh, this uh, bosonic coherent states, uh, and the idea is that this is a uh, quantum state which approaches to our classical picture uh, of. Uh, let's say, harmonic oscillator, right? So it's basically exponent operation operator. And now you can very easily see that if we apply annihilation operator uh, on the state, let's just write this uh, state exclusively. We expand uh, the exponent, right? And uh, so it starts with just one. We create one uh, boson. We create uh, a pair of bosons and so on. And then when we can annihilate, right? Well, uh, of course, when annihilation operator adds uh, on back, we get zero. 
our knowledge and operate of uh, optimum state with one boson, which is get uh, uh, one uh, so optimum state, and so on. And you can see just by going through this uh, term by term that we uh, get uh, this uh, coefficient in this form and times the original state. So these recurrent states have this remarkable properties uh, that they are eigenstates of annihilation operate, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, when we think about coherent states, we can think about question annihilation operators as C numbers. And uh, so if you write a state this way, uh, and one thing you should be aware of, it's not normalized, that, that's why there is a coefficient in front, and a way to uh, normalize it is to actually again introduce a unitary operator. You can again see that this is, uh, if I put I in front of it, uh, then uh, we will get a permission uh, operator, and it will be like a momentum or a monic like one of I and I of minus B. But, so therefore, I can write a big, can think about this e to I times momentum. Right? It's exponential <coughs> image of I times permission uh, uh, operator, therefore it's unique. And uh, that's uh, something that is commonly called displacement operator. So that's a uh, construction that will come up uh, uh, over and over again. Okay, so let me start uh, by reminding, uh, by first talking about something that should be very familiar to you, right? It's what I do of theory of weakly interacting uh, was a gas. So, uh, okay, our uh, uh, initial model, right, we just have particles which have some kinetic uh, energy, we have interaction, uh, which we take as, as a kind of contact interaction. And so zero for the approximation uh, when uh, interaction is uh, very small, we just say that uh, all the particles are condensed, right? And we approximate the macroscopic condensation just by saying that all our atoms, uh, we can think about our initial state as a coherent state, right? Where we have a coherent state constructed out of bosons with momentum equal to zero, right? And we can think about uh, this again as this sh uh, shift operator. And then what we do, we uh, sort of expand in, uh, uh, around uh, this coherent state, and as we said, the advantage of coherent state is that you can we can treat both uh, uh, operators as C numbers, which is what we do. We basically uh, treat operators which uh, annihilate the gray bosons at that at momentum zero as C number and replace them just by square root of the number of particles, right? And uh, then we say this n0 is very large, uh, therefore the terms which we have to pick up, uh, we sort of have to just collect the reading of the terms, so, uh, and, uh, uh, that, uh, so, and then also have to satisfy uh, momentum, so let's say we would not be able to just take, uh, say, three terms uh, uh, with k equal to zero, because the fourth one would also have to have momentum zero, but we can take two, right? And that's how we get our usual value of mean q of Newtonian, uh, you can see that it's the open source moment, right? If we got pressure annihilation operator, we got particles with the same momentum uh, P, or if we got uh, two creation operators, uh, we uh, have uh, particles with the opposite moment, right? And we also think about this physical as taking two particles on the condensate and creating a P minus P. And then uh, uh, what we do with, in this approximation, we actually diagonalize this. Right? We find a transformation uh, which uh, takes this quadratic Hamiltonian and puts it in a way that we just to count the number of the citation. And uh, I hope you remember that the way uh, this is accomplished is by uh, doing this uh, famous Bogarubov transformation. Right? So we actually find that uh, we have to replace uh, our original operation annihilation operators by new operators of uh, so quasi particle, Bogarubov quasi particle operators, and now this that uh, they, uh, it's still, it's a construction, we're actually doing a construction which can show momentum, right? So now our uh, boson at momentum P, the superposition of the particle of momentum P, it's uh, annihilation, of creation, uh, and of course, if it's creation, then we have to take lines. So therefore, uh, momentum is about to define uh, quantum number for the uh, value of the uh, particle. But actually, uh, uh, let me give you another perspective on uh, this logarithmic transformation. If you think about uh, how I can uh, uh, think about this transformation, you uh, realize, well, actually, it can be understood from the point of view of uh, uh, this kind of unitary transformation. So if I take, it's again something very similar to what we did for fermions last time. I will not go 
uh, through the proof will actually uh, see very similar analysis in the more general case. Uh, but it's also something that you can very easily do as an exercise, right? That if we simply take this unitary uh, uh, transformation, again, you can see that it's unitary is uh, that if I put an i in here, I will get uh, uh, I'll get a commission operator as I put exponent of i times the commission And then if I sandwich my annihilation operator, uh, the p right, it actually, uh, we can just compute that I will get superposition of my annihilation operator p and the creation operator at minus p. So uh, it's exactly the same available transformation, but now presented from a different perspective, more from, like, as a unitary transformation on the original uh, uh, particles. And uh, notice that this is also, like, when we think about this Gaussian transformation, it is kind of very special, right? It, while really doing transformation using operators uh, that have net momentum zero. Uh, we, use, we use a pair of creation operators or a pair of annihilation operators, uh, but always with a net momentum zero. And that's because when we talk about AC, uh, translational symmetry is not a problem. So uh, from this perspective, then actually, if you think about what uh, is it uh, that uh, how do we think about uh, the Bogalubo Brown state for positives? You realize that it actually can be thought of as uh, two unitary operators applied to the Brown state. So the first is just displacement operator, right? And so what this uh, displacement operator does, it uh, sort of basically gives us a, a, a macroscopic number of uh, bosons into a state uh, with zero momentum. And uh, then the second part of the transformation is uh, the Spokaribov transformation, which gives us a quantum depletion, which says, well, actually, in the Spokaribov state, we do not only uh, have uh, condensate at k equal to zero, we also have pairs of particles at k minus p, and that's exactly is what this Gaussian transformation accomplishes. And, and uh, just as we did in the previous lecture, because when we said, oh, this uh, Gaussian state can be thought of as Gaussian transformations, uh, which act in vacuum, uh, for many practical purposes, uh, we can actually will be interested in thinking how these transformations uh, uh, apply to the operators by right? that, that exercise which we saw uh, previously. Right? Say how the Gaussian transformation to form rotation of very positive particles. Okay, so uh, so this was uh, really just a reminder. Let me maybe uh, now uh, write some of these. Uh, things, uh, because we'll refer to them uh, later on. So when we talk about the Lubov theory, the Lubov theory of BC, right, we say that the sign of the Lubov can be understood as a combination of Gaussian transformation uh, times this uh, displacement so coherent right, acting in vacuum to so u coherent is exponent of square root of times zero is u minus b zero u uh, Gaussian Theta of P, V of the dagger minus V of P, V of minus P. Uh, and then we also saw that, let's say, under transformation, let's say we do uh, U uh, dagger Gauss, uh, V of P, U Gauss, we have uh, cos theta P. C minus symmetry. Okay, um, so uh, now let's uh, generalize this construction, right? Because uh, uh, we want to look at uh, kind of states which are constructed in the same spirit but uh, more general. So let me uh, introduce uh, notations. So just like for fermions, we chose to work not with Dirac notation of the separation annihilation group, rather with Majorana. Actually, uh, uh, in the case of Gaussian states, uh, because uh, it's also 
convenient to introduce real objects, right? So we'll introduce, think about it as is, if we think of these as harmonic oscillated degrees of freedom, so we can introduce like a, a coordinate and moment. But again, it's just linear transformation between the original creation and annihilation. And just as Thierry uh, uh, pointed out yesterday, that it's always uh, uh, good to, to make something material in, in the nodes, in the lectures, to keep you guys awake, and also he was interchanging K and one of the K. So, uh, what I'll keep is I'll keep a factor of two in the commutation relation between P and S. <laughs> so, uh, finally, actually, it turns out that this is something. Uh, the way uh, we're doing this, we uh, actually used some of the terminology of quantum information, and for some reason that's one of the following limitations, which is uh, subset of figures. Uh, uh, anyway, so now what uh, we do is uh, that we have uh, n bosons, right? And again, this can correspond to uh, creation and annihilation operators of bo bosons at all possible moments, right? So, uh, out of this, we can construct X and P, and uh, we uh, uh, represent them as a long uh, polar. And uh, now uh, we basically generalize uh, construction, right, which we saw for the uh, for box theory of BEC by saying, let's define the Gaussian operator. So uh, the first part, actually, if you uh, look at it, is exactly this, uh, what we call the shift operator. Right, so you can see that this part, right, is shift operator, so it's linear in R, it's linear in X and P, which means it's linear in creation annihilation operator. So it's exactly like this coherent when we have like a single creation and annihilation operator inside the exponent. And uh, then we also have a second piece, right, which is now quadratic in this vector R. And of course, when it's quadratic, it means that if I write it in terms of creation annihilation operators, it will have uh, two, let's say, dagger, we can have uh, B dagger B. So this generalizes uh, this uh, kind of Gaussian part of what we saw for the Bogorubov wave function. But then again, and again, as I said, in the Bogorubov wave function, we were very strongly constrained uh, by translation of invariance. So, for example, uh, when we have translation invariance, I know that they cannot have uh, cooperation operators with different momentum because that would actually violate. Uh, to make a state which is not translational in there. So I cannot mix creation and annihilation operators with different moments. Again, it can break translational in there. But gener generally, uh, we may be looking at states which do break translational in there. Uh, so as you will see, uh, if they don't, we sample work in the frame, like little of Pine's frame that Fabio told you about, where we, all, we, we no longer have a translation in there. That's why we have to allow kind of general uh, well, exponents with a general but this But the spirit of the transformation is exactly what uh, you're familiar with in Bogaryuk. Uh, Again, you can see that all of these transformations, uh, they will an exponent of uh, uh, permission operators. That's okay, it's just not required to decide. Uh, uh, so it, it's a, uh, it has to be a real matrix also because uh, R are uh, permission operators. Okay. Good. Uh, and uh, so now, what uh, then we say that after we define this operator with a Gaussian transformation, we define our Gaussian state as just this Gaussian operator acting on back of the state. Right? And we say that this uh, is a uh, displacement operator and this is generalized for variable transformation. And what I uh, want to argue is uh, that actually, uh, just as we uh, discussed in the last lecture, for many practical calculations, instead of thinking of, you know, really sort of trying to understand what happened to our new grounds uh, to vacuum state when we got this Bogorubov state, uh, we would rather ask how do operators transform uh, under this opera operator, say displacement operators. And what I want to show is. Uh, let's say displacement, uh, when we sandwich, uh, uh, let's say this R operator, when this R is a, like X or P, maybe something which is linear in creation knowledge. When we sandwich it uh, between this displacement operator, well, we just shift this uh, operator R, that's why we call it a displacement operator. Whereas uh, if we take a variable transformation, and uh, now we sandwich this R 
right, between uh, this Bogart generalized Bogart transformation, we get some kind of rotation. Again, it should be familiar. It, it's, it's very similar right, to what we saw for the Bogalubov theory. We, if we put this Bogalubov around uh, uh, the annihilation operator, we get a superposition of annihilation and creation operator. But only now, it's a more complicated object because we allow for a general class of transformation, and therefore this rotation matrix is yes, uh, some is uh, like exponent of the matrix that, uh, that enters uh, uh, in the unit operator itself. But again, it's about the structure is very similar. Like here, we have an exponent, and it's a good idea if you remember. Uh, if you look at it, you recognize we have quashes and cinches. But again, just a matrix generalization of uh, what we saw in the good So let me at least show you some algebra. Let's say, how do we prove this type of uh, identities? It's, uh, the logic is very similar to what we did for chromions. Let's say we want to uh, ask how this shift operator right, affect uh, my R operator by X of D. So, okay, let me uh, introduce a sort of, uh, let me do, if you wish, uh, the shift operator not completely, but let me scale it by coefficient lambda, right? If lambda is equal to zero, I don't do any transformation. When lambda is equal to one, that's what I want, that's the shift operator. Right, so I know that, as we said, the number is equal to zero, right? And these operators are just unity, so R uh, at lambda equal to zero is shifted R tilde, the transformed R tilde should go back to original R. And now I just take the derivative, right, with respect to lambda, and as before, when we take the derivative with respect to lambda, then uh, simply expression that we have in the exponent go downstairs, right, in this case it will be sort of R times, right, this delta, right, it's just, it's a vector, but it's a C number, right, so really it's only Operator part is the same R, we are, and then it's the uh, R itself for which uh, is being transformed. Of course, lambda comes in with the opposite uh, sign on the two sides, that's why we get a commutator. And, uh, okay, and uh, so the commutator of R is very easy, right? Because basically R is constructed of X and P. Right? So the commutator of X and P, right, if it's the same degree of freedom, uh, uh, it's one, if this are different, it's mine. Uh, it's zero, right? Uh, and that's why the commutator of R is actually, remember we had our R was really uh, able to uh, write it. So R vector. When we constructed R, uh, it really looked like uh, x1, x2, xn, p1, p2, dn. Right, so now you can see that, okay, so the commutator, right, between different components of R is then zero only while looking at the same, sort of the same X1 and the same Q1, right? So that will be, therefore, it should be a unit matrix, right, but also it's a diagonal uh, of <coughs> unit matrix, but it's sub-matrix of the two angular two Okay, so uh, now that, okay, the commutator uh, of this 2R is a C number, uh, therefore, which uh, uh, we can uh, take out and then actually back it uh, adds up to be in exactly one, and therefore we will see that actually this uh, u dagger and u cancel each other exactly, and uh, so uh, that this uh, is, uh, uh, and what we, we find is uh, that uh, the derivative with respect to lambda is simply given by uh, this uh, delta itself, this uh, in this way, a C number, a, a C vector which enters into the shift of transformation, right? So this delta right, is a vector. And, okay, so now we know the value of R lambda equal to zero, we know the derivative uh, with respect to lambda is a constant, therefore uh, clearly if, we, if lambda is equal to one, well, that's our transformation. If it, if indeed, it's just a shift. Right, so that's a good way of sort of shifting uh, uh, X and P operators. Okay, uh, then we can do a similar uh, uh, trick for uh, For well, the Bogarubo part, generalized Bogarubo part, let me uh, skip this, I just point out the uh, kind of idea again, we just introduce this kind of, uh, uh, we do partial transformation, which uh, sort of is scaled by lambda, we take the root with respect to lambda, <coughs> and actually in this case, what uh, it turns out that we will not get something as simple as the derivative is a constant, but we will get a differential equation, the derivative of the scale transform R is R itself of the same scale lambda, and uh, then we can solve this uh, differential equation and get this transformation. Okay, so uh, why uh, is this useful? Because knowing this transformation uh, uh, rules, we can 
now uh, prove something, uh, some very uh, useful properties of the Gaussian states, right? To define Gaussian states using the shift uh, transformation of generalized Bogolubov. Uh, but then, if I want to take expectation value right, of this x and p, well, I get precisely what uh, is in my shift operator, the addition in the shift operator. Or if I want to look at fluctuations, right, I notice that this delta r is really how this variable r differs from its average value. Right? And so we can uh, uh, easily, uh, uh, we'll see in a second, that uh, we can calculate the fluctuations of delta r, so set and order fluctuation, they now correspond given by this correlation uh, uh, function, or we can also think of, like in, in the language of quantum optics, it's called the squeeze part uh, of uh, bosonic error. Okay, and so the way to prove this is uh, 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 very easy, right? It's we need uh, something very similar to Fermionic Gaussian state. What was, okay, we write our, but we have to take expectation now of, say, R operating with Gaussian state. So we represent a Gaussian state, right, as the Rubov transformation times shift. Uh, and uh, so this is prime, this is the get part, and then we have this R operator. Then we say, well, actually, so this. We already know, and now instead of thinking of this as being part of the initial state, let's just think about this D dagger in D sandwiching the operator R. So we know how it transforms, right? It just gives us R operator plus this shift. Okay, now this shift is a C number, now we can easily take it out. And because here we have uh, U dagger times U, that's just one, right? So that uh, part is easy. Uh, and then uh, for the other part, now we have the operator R sandwiched between the Bogolubov transformation. Right? And again, we know what happens to it, uh, so this uh, is uh, simple rotation of the R operator itself. And uh, uh, so therefore what's left to calculate is just expectation value of R in vacuum. But of course, what's expectation value of X in vacuum? It's just zero. And therefore, this is zero, so okay, that's how we very easily find expectation value of R in the Gaussian state. And uh, then it's very similar trick uh, <coughs> want to calculate fluctuations of variable R, right, so we take a symmetrized uh, uh, correlation uh, function, right, uh, uh, put it between the Gaussian states, uh, right, this is, uh, so this is sort of the cat part, this is the bra, uh, and then we uh, start thinking about these operators acting on uh, operators and sides, so you can very easily check that, okay, uh, so delta R uh, was, uh, Mind that delta r we defined was uh, say r i minus uh, delta r i, but so if r is an operator, right? But delta r i is a number, and therefore if we think uh, how the d operator x and delta i is really only x non trivially on r i, like on the c number, it just doesn't do anything, so you can very easily check that uh, the shift operator just turns uh, delta r back into the original r, and then uh, we are now have uh, the for the Rubov transformation, we know how it acts on uh, uh, this R operator as well. But you, here you can see that it's kind of like uh, U dagger in U on the two sides, and I can always insert U dagger in, uh, sorry, U U dagger, right? So that I'll have U dagger R U, and then another U dagger R U, right? And all of this, uh, when I, uh, I know how U operator transforms R, it just gives me this rotation matrix as S, and now we are left with calculating something that looks like calculation of x squared or p squared or xp in vacuum. Again, something uh, which we can uh, very easily do. Okay. So, uh, and uh, now, uh, in which cases uh, the knowledge of Gaussian states uh, is sufficient? Well, if the Hamiltonian is quadratic, right? And so, remember, we can in Spogarubov, uh, Theory of BEC, when we reduced our interactive Hamiltonian to effective quadratic Hamiltonian, we showed that we could actually solve it exactly by doing Bogolubov transformation. So, in fact, uh, uh, it turns out that as long as uh, we have uh, arbitrary time dependence right, uh, uh, of the Hamiltonian, but this, uh, this Hamiltonian contains only linear terms in creation annihilation operation, quadratic terms in creation annihilation operation. Uh, then you can give an exact uh, solution. Right, we just write out the Hamiltonian as this matrix, right, and then uh, 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 start. We have our Gaussian state characterized uh, by expectation value of the operator to the coherent part uh, and uh, the squeezed part, also to the fluctuating part, and then there are closed equations on the coherent part and the squeezed part. Right, 
and this is the exact solution of time dynamics uh, of the Gaussian state uh, for the quadratic uh, Obviously, in uh, the real world, we are interested in systems. A bit about polarons uh, in uh, the school, so let me uh, add another type of polaron. Just uh, make uh, uh, <coughs> so that you familiarize, familiarize yourself with a kind of larger zoo of polarons. So when we talk about polarons in traditional solid state uh, physics, uh, uh, there are actually two canonical types of polarons uh, that people describe. And here I uh, show them schematically. So uh, again, this is Newtonian, I think about this as the fermions, which let's say hop between different sides. So these are our opponents. And then uh, the type of electron phonon coupling that you can imagine is uh, that if I uh, have a phonon, what it can do, it can change the local uh, potential right, uh, on the given side. Right? Uh, that's actually the phonon which we are more used to. That's the so-called uh, Holstein model. But the, there is another type of phonon which uh, actually, when uh, excited, it changes tunneling between the two sides. So it doesn't change on-site energy, but it changes tunneling. So this is the so-called sushi or Higgins model. Uh, originally, it was introduced uh, uh, to talk about polyacetylene, uh, uh, so the type of like, chain-like uh, organic molecules. But it turns out that this type of uh, uh, electron phonon coupling plays a very important role in a variety of systems. Let's say, like the superator, the model uh, uh, from Fabian, uh, which is generally strongly related to electron systems. So. Uh, like when we talk about cold atom uh, analogies, perhaps uh, you know these kind of hosting models uh, are more familiar. But actually, what I want to do now is talk about the uh, sushi torpedo model, uh, polar right? It's uh, because, as we said, it's quite an important uh, uh, microscopic model in its own right. So we kind of trade the problem of uh, 
bosons interacting with an impurity for a problem in which uh, impurity is now non-interacting, but uh, uh, there is an interaction induced between the bosons. And now what we can do uh, is uh, that, okay, well, it's a kind of complicated <coughs> interaction uh, for the bosons, so uh, doing anything analytically uh, with this sort of perturbation through would be hard, but as long as we're doing variational states, uh, it's actually uh, uh, not such a big deal. So, in fact, if we uh, say that we have a Gaussian state for our opponents, uh, then uh, we can just write explicitly what the energy is. Okay, it's uh, somewhat cumbersome, right? So now you see that uh, we have to know, uh, so we have this correlation uh, matrix, right? We have to know the inverse, we have to calculate determinants, and so on, but these are kind of fairly straightforward uh, uh, things. Uh, and uh, now we can also, once we have, uh, we know the energy, we can differentiate it respect to parameters such as this uh, shift uh, or the correlation matrix and we can just compute uh, right let's say if we want to calculate the ground state uh, and uh, something uh, again what is unique to the SSH model uh, and that uh, we uh, easily capture within this variational approach is that as we increase electron phonon interaction dispersion changes qualitatively so a small electron phonon interaction you see that we still have a minimum and k equal to zero that is, we make interaction larger, uh, then the minimum of the dispersion actually is shifted to finite infinite. Right. So it's actually a phase transition of some uh, kind when the minimum uh, moves from uh, polar on k the lowest energy at zero moment to the polar on k uh, the lowest energy at finite moment. Something that is uh, and very difficult to get from perturbation theory, but uh, so people, let's say, saw this uh, using Monte Carlo, and here we see uh, this. Uh, using variation of the function. Well, in fact, you can compute uh, even uh, spectral functions, so this is something that, let's say, would for, for the emission uh, would measure. Again, it's something uh, of the type of Floch mean echo. I'm not go through the detail. It's when we, we start in a state and there is no polar on the components in the ground state, then we suddenly add an electron. And as uh, now that we add an electron, of course, it's trying, it, 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 it is exciting phonons, right? We can write these phonons. Uh, and then we walk for some time, then we take an overlap back to the initial state. So that's something that actually angular result for the emission would measure. Right. And uh, we can again do this uh, uh, dynamics, uh, not as we said we can do that in imaginary time, in real time, so in real time uh, you can see the spectral function. And I just want to comment on one thing that, uh, say, uh, if we have just a particle in free space, if we add a particle at a certain momentum, uh, then, you know, we know that, uh, so this omega is like energy, and we really have to uh, create a particle at very specific energy, right, which corresponds to this momentum. But now that we have phonons uh, in the system, uh, then, okay, when we uh, uh, add an electron, we are making, making a polaron, which is a ground state uh, for a given momentum, or we are creating a polaron plus a phonon, plus two phonon, that's why the spectral function has uh, the speaks, which correspond to, let's say, uh, starting uh, with uh, uh, creating the brown state polar or, or, or a polar on uh, with, uh, uh, with a phonon, with polar on two phonons, and so on. And that's something that again we'll actually see later on uh, with different phonons. Okay, so uh, now let me uh, uh, sort of show how the tools which we uh, build up uh, can be used to approach uh, some of the problems which are used to motivate. Like, remember, in the very first lecture, we talk about. Uh, photo induced superconductivity, right? It's this vacuum superconductor, and which has an equilibrium transition temperature of 20 Kelvin. And we said that, well, you shine light, which is resonant uh, with phonons, and somehow in optical response, uh, we start uh, seeing uh, uh, TC, which is, uh, increases, uh, and we see an increase uh, uh, over. Uh, yeah, that's it. Just basically, we start seeing uh, uh, signatures of superconductivity at high temperature. And uh, the model which I uh, sort of uh, advocated was uh, that, in fact, it's a system in which when we shine light, actually, we first try infrared active phonons. This is just phonons which couple strongly to light, but they do not interact strongly uh, with the electrons. But then these infrared active phonons interact with Raman phonons, which uh, now actually are very important. They're the ones which sort of provide this blue for making blue. Superconductivity, but from the point of view of this Raman phonons interaction with infrared active phonons looks like some kind of parametric resonance. 
Uh, that way it's like you can think about it as modulating a spring constant uh, for uh, four months at uh, uh, finite moment. So let me first uh, let me introduce uh, another approach uh, which is commonly used to describe electron quantum systems and I'll uh, uh, do it, uh, that goes under the name of one fish of transformation. So it's sort of just, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not the same as uh, little points, it's really something that uh, is still kind of a unitary transformation when we deal with electron quantum system, but, but little points is very special to having just one impurity, one electron. Now we're looking at a system in which we have many electrons, right? So think about it in the case when I have a finite density of electrons. And uh, so to understand this Hamiltonian, okay, we have electrons popping in the lattice, we have bosons, uh, and then we have, uh, so this is, again, now we're back to the posting technology. We see that the phonons couple to just a local electron density, right? And this is like a Fourier transform uh, of the phonons. You can think about it's like a phonon amplitude inside I. So uh, this land of transformation, uh, the way it's usually done, is to just say, well, actually, I can come up with a very clever transformation that removes this electron quantum uh, coupling completely. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is uh, what it looks like. I will not really uh, prove it to you, just to point out that uh, the way to think about it, this V minus V dot, right? I hope you're familiar by now, right? It's really uh, like momentum operator. And we know if something couples to momentum of a harmonic oscillator, then it looks like, and we put this in the exponent. Right, because we're looking at e to the s. Uh, then this is like a shift operator. So really, you can uh, basically what's happening, uh, uh, what this transformation is doing is uh, that it takes that it takes phonon operators, right, and then if we do to the s e to minus s becomes v of k minus uh, some. Uh, gamma k over omega of k times uh, e to i k r i and i, right? So it basically shifts the phonon operators by, uh, sorry, sum over i, by the amount which depends on configuration of electrons. And in fact, this shift is designed in such a way, right, that if I now shift my d operators, right, uh, in this way, uh, I'll get now sort of this kind of cross terms, which will cancel exactly this interaction, uh, uh, the original interaction between phonons uh, and electrons. But of course, as you already uh, recognize by now, there's no free lunch, right? So you cannot just, you know, do YouTube transformation and suddenly make complicated problems simple. Uh, what, uh, after we do this transformation, uh, okay, we get rid of uh, this direct electron phonon interaction. Uh, we also see uh, kind of something that is very useful. We see an explicit attraction between electrons, right? It shows up here. Uh, because we put in the physics of this matrix effect, if I have the first electron, right, it distorts upon a uh, lattice, creates a screening cloud, and then the second electron is attracted to the screening cloud. That's exactly what this interaction applies. But the price uh, that we pay is that now the popping of electrons is modified, uh, and it's actually modified, it becomes Instead of a C number, it becomes an operator. That's what's called polaronic dressing of the electron form. Right? That now, if electron pops, it will actually excite phonons uh, in the system. Now, it's sort of this original electron phonon interaction just reappears in, it, in this guy. And what is usually done is uh, that uh, people assume that uh, we can. Uh, at this point, uh, we can just take expectation value of this operator uh, by assuming that our phonons is like bad are not affected by electrons. So let's just take it to a thermal equilibrium state, right? Like at low temperatures, it would be a vacuum, at finite temperature, it's finite uh, thermal ensemble. And then the, basically, when we take expectation value of this operator in some equilibrium phonon state, we just get rid of the normalization of James. So that's the polar on dre dressing of the bandwidth. But we assume that it's. Uh, uh, Nothing beyond this kind of band normalization is important. But in principle, but this clearly is not a good approximation for us because we have our intuition, which we discussed before, that when we try phonons, the effective interaction between electrons and 
performance uh, uh, should change, right? Because the way we do this transformation, we can see, for example, that the fact of electron electron interaction is fixed. But I gave you arguments before that um, actually, if I parametrically drive phonons, my electron phonon interaction should, uh, and therefore, effective uh, attractive interaction between electrons uh, should increase. Therefore, we cannot just take expectation value uh, of uh, with respect to equilibrium state performance. We have to do something more clever. And uh, the way to do something uh, more clever is uh, actually treat uh, this uh, Lanthier's of parameters of Lanthier's of transformation uh, to take them as uh, another declaration of degree of freedom. Because again, you can notice that there is a kind of competition. If I choose uh, imagine that I just choose this gamma to be not the same as original gamma in the interaction, but something small. Well, if I take something small, I make my interaction weaker. So attractive interaction between electrons becomes smaller, but then my polaron interaction becomes smaller, and therefore I get better kinetic energy for electrons. And therefore, it's natural to say that, well, we should actually allow the system this freedom to choose how much of polaron interaction it wants to do, to optimize between the effective induced interaction between electrons and suppression of electron kinetic energy. And uh, so that's something that again can be put into the general paradigm of uh, projective dynamics. Uh, so now we take uh, this polaronic transformation to be our uh, like included in our separation of wave functions, and then for our uh, phonons and for our electrons, we just choose a Gaussian state, which we already know how to work, and we can derive explicit equations of motion now for parameters of uh, polaron transformation and parameters of the Gaussian state. Uh, so the advantage of uh, doing it uh, this way is uh, that actually this uh, allows us to describe kind of pump and probe experiment uh, 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 sort of directly. So we can model okay, the pump pulse comes in, which excites phonon, but then as we saw, the way you probe is by sending uh, another light pulse. And now we can just uh, solve equations in time, we send the probe pulse, so in the normal state we see kind of a, a gap in the real part of the conductivity, and we can ask what happens to this gap, uh, sorry, so here that was the original gap, what happens uh, to the uh, gap uh, uh, when we excite the phonons, and we see that actually the gap becomes larger. Right? And that corresponds to uh, what we saw in enhancement of superconductivity, which also in this case manifests as an increase uh, in the positive part. Okay, so uh, another problem that I sort of started introducing but didn't finish last time uh, is Anderson purity model. The same problem. Yeah. Ten. Well, ten. Okay, so that should be enough. So uh, again, I uh, remind you uh, that uh, when we talk about uh, so this Anderson, let me uh, skip this. So the kind of model which. Uh, well, it's sort of again it parallels uh, the argument which Fabian gave before. He said, well, when we deal with strongly in interacting systems, it's always useful to find the minimal model which carries uh, uh, most of the essential features of, uh, let's say, complicated systems. So when we talk about pump and probe experiments in electron systems, we have to deal with electron electron interaction, electron quantum interactions, non equilibrium. So let's try to sort of take the simplest version of it. For this, we take the so-called anderson posting model. So Anderson model is when we have non-interacting bath of electrons <laughs> and one side in which we have strong repulsion. So those of you who are familiar with the MFT actually know that it turns out that if you can solve this problem, then you can build upon it to construct it in a way of solving like cover for many cover models. So but at this point, I'll just be uh, uh, asking, uh, trying to understand how to solve uh, the Anderson impurity. And we also add phonons, right? Because again, it's a ubiquitous feature. Uh, so uh, Fabian previously was selling you uh, work and hold up, but we don't uh, have phonons. But okay, it's still an open question that phonons may play an important role in, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, high DC rates. Okay, so this is exactly our model. So we have one side uh, on which uh, you can think about it as so this. Uh, so we'll see, like, physically, uh, for specific experiment that we discuss, uh, it will be like a level uh, in a molecule, it can be a quantum dot, and uh, so we introduce uh, strong repulsion between electrons on this dot, and then we also assume that uh, there are uh, phonons which couple uh, to the number of electrons uh, on this dot. And uh, 
In fact, uh, uh, there is a specific experiment which we have in mind. Uh, so this uh, is Terracord STM. And uh, the way it's done is follows. Uh, so uh, think about one molecule, it's a fantasy molecule, and uh, it's actually really just, uh, we can think about one type of uh, state, while well, okay, in reality, uh, it's, uh, uh, in this case, if you're familiar with notations uh, for any semiconductor, because it's like Luma orbital and a Homo orbital. Like, in a more traditional semiconductor language, you would just say, oh, it's like a balance band and a uh, conduction band. Right, the balance band is field, so homo orbital is field, uh, and the conduction band is empty. But again, it's like in uh, Luma and Homo, we just have one orbital. Uh, okay, uh, and then uh, in equilibrium, the system is in such a way that the uh, Fermi energy, the chemical potentials, is halfway between Homo and Luma orbitals, so current cannot flow, because this gap is much larger than the energy. And then uh, uh, when they do uh, as, uh, this. So, uh, and the two reservoirs here is uh, there is a metallic substrate and then there is an STM. And then they send in a, a pulse of light. And what the pulse of light does, it actually changes the energy of uh, the T relative to uh, the uh, molecule, right? So you can see that, okay, here it used to be that the chemical potential of STM is the same as the chemical potential uh, of the metal, right? And now we are effectively well lowering, right? Uh, and so, in reality, when we have uh, STM uh, pulse, then actually it sort of goes, it's really, you can think about it uh, as electric field, which uh, moves uh, the energy uh, of the STM orbital uh, either up or low, uh, either uh, low or high, but uh, the pulse is very asymmetric. So you can see that it actually it lowers uh, uh, this STM from energy uh, to such a way that uh, the Luma orbital becomes resonant. So now electrons from the Luma orbital can turn into the metal. But it never quite, make, quite makes it to the common orbital. Right. Therefore, when we think about dynamics, uh, uh, kind of the burst of current which is induced by this STM pulse, we actually don't have to uh, include uh, the high orbital, we just uh, uh, include the common orbital. Right. So that, that's why uh, we think about as an Anderson model, right? it's really just one state. Right? Of course, it can accommodate spin up and spin down electrons. So, uh, and uh, we have to include interaction uh, between the electrons. But then, uh, okay, so where the components can be, well, actually, uh, okay. the motivation comes from experiment. It turns out that when they, uh, again, when they did the experiment in a pump and probe, uh, uh, and the method, so they first send this first pulse, uh, right, of current, and then after some time they send the second pulse and look at the current uh, in the second pulse as a function of duration, uh, uh, as a function of uh, delay with respect to the first pulse, and they see this very kind of long lead oscillations which they can easily identify with a very characteristic phonon mode which exists in this mode. So somehow by sending the first pulse, uh, we excited some kind of uh, uh, phonon vibration, and this phonon vibration uh, then affects the flow of current uh, into the profile. So therefore, we have all the ingredients of the model that we have. Uh, so we have one orbital, we have Coulomb repulsion electrons in this orbital, and we have a uh, phonon. Okay, right, so that's our like, anderson Boltzmann model uh, that uh, we want to study. So now what uh, I remember in the, what I want to what I already talked uh, sort of said previously and what I emphasize uh, again if you we shouldn't rush uh, sort of doing this kind of simple mean field approximations uh, uh, with the Hamiltonian itself it's always useful to utilize whatever symmetry we have so to entangle degrees of freedom so I've told you about the of lines transformation which entangle impurity with the boson. In the case of Kondo, uh, a model I told you about the conservation of the parity, like a symmetry of rotation by pi, which we were able to swap for the spin of the impurity, and therefore the spin of the impurity became conserved. Uh, the same, uh, uh, see, actually, we have very similar symmetry in the Anderson model. Again, those of you who are uh, familiar uh, with uh, in the relation uh, uh, with strongly correlated systems, uh, should recognize that Anderson model is really kind of an ancestor of uh, the of the condo model, right? So remember, in the condo, 
model. So uh, we say that we have a reservoir and we have a spin, right, but as impurity, and the interaction, if this is r equal to zero, is h is equal to some j times s impurity times psi alpha beta zero sigma alpha beta. Psi beta of zero. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we talk about Anderson model, uh, so there is a quantum regime, right? So basically, say that there is a quantum dot, there is a reservoir, and where in the regime, where if we put just one electron in here, let's say it has energy epsilon d, but then if we try to put a second electron, its energy would be epsilon d plus u, and this is much higher uh, than the forming energy. And therefore, we know that we'll always have just one electron, but it can be one electron which is either spin up, uh, or it can actually, we can have, uh, or spin, uh, well, let me not confuse it, let me just, so it's one electron, uh, but its spin can be up or down. And in fact, if we consider kind of virtual processes when electron comes from the path, uh, uh, but then an then electron tunnels out, it can be electron with the opposite spin, which tunnels back, and that's how we, uh, uh, we can derive this exchange quantum. So exchange, if we think about hybridization D, right, it's something that uh, goes as, let's say, B squared over Fermi energy minus epsilon D, or this is in case when first this electron tunnels out and then the second comes back, or if we first do double occupancy uh, and then uh, electron comes out, we have B squared over epsilon D plus U minus E term. So, uh, Actually, seeing quantum physics from the Anderson model is usually and kind of requires uh, going through some intermediate steps, right? It doesn't come out as an input though. You have to integrate out degrees of freedom. So that's one of the challenges that we're dealing with degrees of freedom on different scales, on the scale of u and on the scale of this uh, j and then pondo, right, which is exponentially small j. So, and what we're trying to do is actually capture well, all of this physics in sort of one adoption. And we also throw in quantum. Okay, so uh, uh, the way, uh, again, what we'll be using is uh, that uh, there is still a kind of a symmetry, the model has a symmetry of rotation around SC, right? rotation by pi. And that's something that we can utilize. Well, unfortunately, we cannot utilize it as effectively as in the case of the quantum model. If I'm in the quantum model, we use the symmetry to completely eliminate impurity degrees of freedom. But now, in the case of Anderson model, we have just more degrees of freedom, right? I have, uh, if I think about uh, states on my uh, orbital, okay, uh, okay, so maybe I can have a state in which there are no electrons at all, I have one electron which spin up or spin down, or I have both electrons together, so I have four states. Right? Uh, and I, uh, so, uh, but I can use this parity as it turns out to eliminate uh, two of the states. Since okay, time is short, I'll not go through uh, all of the steps. Uh, uh, I'll just uh, show the result. That, okay, so what we can do is uh, that uh, when we're done, we sort of we're left with just uh, one fermionic degree of freedom on the impurity level, which uh, accounts for the residual. Uh, two states, right? You kind of eliminate a couple of the states using uh, conservation, using parity conservation. And then when we add an additional fermion, we now have state when this fermion is absent, or this fermion is present, and that completes uh, the possibility of having four states. So again, we kind of traded uh, some of the degrees of freedom of the impurity for uh, interactions. And now what we do is, okay, we take this Hamiltonian, which is just an interacting Hamiltonian, oh, and for now let me uh, uh, without, so what we're doing is just understand the model. For now, I switched off the forms. Right, again, it's because it's some kind of canonical problem, you know, it really underlies a lot of our understanding of strongly correlated systems. We first need to demonstrate that we can deal with the Anderson model. And so, what you find, again, you can, you can calculate uh, the spectral function. And what is uh, quite remarkable is that from basically a single state determinant state, is uh, we get a spectral function which has a hallmark of the quantum physics. It's a resonance at zero energy. So usually, to get this resonance in the spectral function, you really have to go through many intermediate steps. Can you go from Anderson model to the quantum model, and for quantum model, do some kind of RG, something very sophisticated, like slave particles, to get a quantum resonance. 
whereas here it actually comes out from the Gaussian state. Okay, so this regime where we have a single occupancy is not a I mean, it's not relevant to experiments which I showed you, I remind you that before the pulse we had two electrons. Uh, uh, so you can also analyze two electrons, uh, and it's kind of not as exciting, but still, uh, hopefully in future experiments, they using quantum dots, uh, they will be able to realize quantum vision. And uh, so, uh, we now have to bring together all the tools which we sort of discussed before, so we have to add uh, this polar transformation, right, which basically shifts phonons, and you see it's something that, uh, that it's now much general. Previously, I only coupled to uh, the momentum of the phonons. Now I allow to couple to both x and p. Uh, and uh, this kind of shift of phonon degrees of freedom depends on the occupation number of electrons. But parameters of uh, this polar shift are now vibrational parameters. And we also have uh, this kind of rotation. Uh, which utilizes parity conservation and uh, uh, we use fermionic Gaussian state. And with this we can then uh, sort of study both, uh, say again, the spectral functions, so we can uh, look, for example, uh, at, let's see, at the evolution uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the basic of the electron density of states, and we see that uh, weak electron quantum interaction actually still uh, uh, allows for the existence uh, of the condo resonance, but that's when uh, condo interaction becomes sufficiently strong, actually the peak at zero energy is gone, and the way to understand uh, this is, remember we said that uh, uh, this, uh, this J, right, effective condo interaction depends on the matrix element for tunneling, but we have polaronic dressing, right, if polaronic dressing becomes very strong, this J becomes uh, very weak, uh, but T condo, Right? If we think about the energy scale for quantum, it actually goes as e to minus 1 over the density of states times j. So therefore, if we renormalize uh, quantum like exchange, our quantum scale gets exponentially suppressed, and so we are losing the quantum. And that is something that comes out from uh, uh, this uh, population. Okay, so, uh, see, so maybe I'll just... Uh, I'll not uh, talk about detailed comparisons, just to point out that while well, we can also model, let's see, what happens uh, with the system when we uh, apply, when we can really kind of look at dynamics following a terahertz pulse, uh, which lowers uh, the energy of one of the reservoirs, as we said, this causes a current to flow, and this, uh, of course, couples to phonons, and then we can look at what's happening to phonons, uh, and we see that we have very long with phonon oscillations, and we actually see different time scales, say charge equilibrates uh, much faster uh, compared to phonons, and we can uh, these phonons are extremely long with oscillation, just as we saw uh, in experiments. Okay, so uh, I think uh, with this uh, I'll just uh, finish. So I will try to give you a few examples uh, when non-equilibrium physics is really crucial uh, in uh, uh, modern condensed experiments, so I talk about both in use of connectivity, the steroid system experiments, and I give you a view or a perspective on one of the approaches which uses variational wave functions, uh, which start from something that we're all familiar with, which are Gaussian states, uh, which are just generalization of sort of PCS wave functions of our support for electrons for for the of state for bosons, but then we can uh, also utilize uh, uh, things uh, like uh, uh, additional degrees of freedom, such as polar transformation or existence of uh, conservation laws, to get very non-trivial physics uh, out of it. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't put uh, that. 
real. Uh, but uh, actually, it turns out, maybe it's something useful to know, uh, that we know that when we write the question, we actually really uh, work with this matrix. Because uh, it turns out that uh, this, uh, if I want to do a Bogorovic transformation, the, this psi is not uniquely defined. Because you can think about it, well, I, I act with this in vacuum, but I can do a whole bunch of transformations, so I don't do anything to the vacuum. Right? So it turns out that I can actually, there is a gauge degree of freedom uh, in this side. That's why uh, when you derive equations of motion, you don't actually derive equations of motion on the side, but you derive something that does not have uh, uh, this ambiguity, this gauge degree of freedom, and, and this is really uh, this uh, kind of covariance matrix right, of this equation. Right? And this is now symmetric. Okay. And then the other thing is, uh, so earlier we we heard about uh, a different variational onsox for a single, for, for a polaron, the, the Chevy, is that the right name for it? What do you mean, for the fermionic? Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So this is actually very, so polarons which uh, I described here, it was kind of a boson polaron, right? It was an impurity in the boson gas. So uh, actually, uh, right, this is very different from the Chevy in the sense uh, that Chevy uh, allows only uh, kind of one particle polarization. Superposition, but you know every piece of wave function is just one part of all the same page. Whereas uh, this, uh, uh, if we use uh, Gaussian and that it's something more tricky, we do exponent of something. Like in the simplest case, think about it as starting with the Fermi C. Right, I start with the Fermi C, and then I uh, add an operator which, let's say, has a sum of uh, I create an operator which it. it uh, which is above k from me, and I lay an operator uh, which is below the from surface. Q is less than equal to k from me with some f of k and q. Right. So, uh, in this case, uh, you are sort of you cannot create just one particle polarization. You put it in the exponent. Therefore, if you created one particle polarization, the Gaussian nature forces you to have maybe small amplitude, but of having uh, and also a pair of particle polarizations. So. Uh, at this point, I think actually uh, there, uh, this kind of Gaussian ansatz uh, has not been quite applied to study from polarons, so we don't know how they will do. So what we do know is that when impurity becomes infinitely large, when we go to a signality catastrophe, Chevy ansatz just must fail because you know you have to generate infinite number of particle polarizations and. Uh, whereas uh, this kind of Gaussian state is the exact answer. So we expect that for heavy impurities, uh, they should really start winning uh, over, uh, uh, over Chevy ansatz, but the de detailed study has not been uh, uh, made yet, and there are actually uh, interesting ideas of maybe merging the two. So, because you know, it's always better to have a rich class of wave functions. Questions? The last chance would be during the lunch time. So, if not, during the entire regime. Now, maybe the last speaker about this liberty of actually thanking Hussein for all the hard work he has done organizing this fantastic scroll, which we all enjoyed very much. So, thank you, Hussein.